When we put a forcing function into an ODE, it has to have units of x over t. Thus the integral of f dt is sort of the total amount of x that was externally added into the system. Let's think about what happens as we deliver a constant amount of total x over shorter and shorter times. We could start with a window of length 1 and height 1. Then we could replace that with a window of length a half, but it would have to have height 2 in order to keep the total amount constant. And then we could use width a quarter with a height of 4 and so on. The idea is that we always keep the total amount added to the system constant, but deliver it over shorter and shorter time periods. We can formalize this idea as follows. Define this function delta sub epsilon as the window function of length epsilon, but having unit area under the curve. Let x sub epsilon be the solution of our linear ODE with delta sub epsilon as the forcing function. If we take the limit of this solution as epsilon goes to zero, we call the result the impulse response to the ODE. We can work out all the details for this when the coefficient a of t is constant. From time 0 to epsilon, the forcing is at a constant 1 over epsilon. So we need a homogeneous solution and a particular solution that has to be constant. We can easily figure out what that constant has to be. And that gives us the general solution on this segment. Then we apply the initial condition to that, and we find the constant C1. So that's our first segment. For t greater than epsilon, the forcing is just turned off. So we only have the homogeneous solution. The initial time for this segment is at t equals epsilon, and we evaluate the previous segment there in order to get the new initial value. That's used to determine C2 for the second segment of the solution. Now we let epsilon go to zero in order to find the impulse response. The only part we care about is the second segment, because it's, we're only uh, looking at t greater than epsilon, and epsilon's going to zero. We can actually use L'Hopital's rule to find this limit. Remember when we do that, since epsilon is the variable and the limit, we have to take derivative of numerator and denominator with respect to epsilon. And you find that this whole limit is just 1. So the impulse response to the problem is e to the at. But hold on a second, that function is also the solution to the unforced version of the problem if we had an initial value of 1 instead of 0. So we found that the impulse response with a 0 initial value is the same as kicking the initial value up from 0 to 1 instantly and then going on as though there's no forcing at all.
let's generalize. To keep with our original delta sub epsilon notation, if we want an impulse at time capital T, we describe that as the solution of the ODE with a forcing function that is delta of T minus capital T. This is usually called the delta function or the Dirac delta function. It doesn't actually behave like a function should, so it's not really a function, but don't worry about that. The key fact of solving a problem with impulse forcing is to just generalize the earlier derivation. So if our forcing includes k times delta of t minus capital T, then the solution gets an instantaneous jump of size k at time capital T. And that's the only effect of the delta. So we can again use a piecewise strategy for solving the problem. Here's an example of impulse forcing. We note that there will be a jump in the solution at t equals 2. Up to that time, we have a homogeneous problem with the original initial condition. This should be very routine by now. The solution is just e to the negative 5t. So as we approach the time 2, from the left on this segment, x approaches e to the negative 10. The initial value of the next solution segment is just 3 greater than that left-sided limit. three greater because that's the multiplication of the delta. So we use that to find C2 in this segment. I might as well go ahead and write this in that this is the right-sided limit at 2. Everything else is routine. I'll rewrite this solution segment in a certain way just to make a point. This term is actually just an exponential decay solution that was delayed by two time units. That is the full effect of the impulse right there. Finally, we can write the entire solution in just one formula by using a step function that turns on at time t equals 2. Here's a computational solution of an impulse problem, the same one that I did as an example. So in the first part of the solution, we just have the unforced equation with the original initial condition. So you don't even see anything happen until that impulse kicks in at time two. So here I've solved up to time two. And now after the impulse, it's still the unforced equation. But what we've done is we've taken that solution at time two, and we add three to that to become the initial condition for the second phase. And so it looks odd because there's a jump in the solution. It's not continuous anymore, um, but that's correct. It looks a little bit more transparent if you put this on a log scale because, of course, exponential decay is just a straight line. So we have exponential decay, and all of a sudden you inject some more into the solution, but then it exponentially decays again after that. 